Hello everyone, this is Remlays from 40k Theories, and welcome to this newest episode of Adeptus Podcasters. Joining me as always is Michael from Tactica Imperialis. Hello everyone. And our guest this week is the internet's favourite remembrancer, Oculus Imperia. Favourite? That's so That's so sweet. Giagoia Chakorja, thanks for having me back guys, it's wonderful to be back. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, obviously you've had a lot of... Uh, TTS fame since your last appearance, which was many months ago, back in episode 54, as I recall. Yeah, uh, the, the, the funny thing is about that is that, like, I showed up in the episode previous to the one that just came out and no one appeared to notice, but then I got a few more lines in this one, and as such, suddenly people have realized that the Chronicler is both a thing and also me, which is yeah, great. I admit, um, I don't get told about what goes on in TTS, so everything for me is completely unexpected. So I admit when it came up in the credits of the episode before that, wait, hang on, because I, obviously <laughs> I know what you sound like, but well, people are good at putting voices on and also Alpha's very, very good at voice editing. Yes, he is. Yes, he, he is. Yeah, and also getting, uh, getting things out of you that you don't necessarily quite expect you're able to come up to. <laughs> like, he's very good at directing you when you are, um, when you're, doing the lines and something yeah. I'm very grateful for that way. Yes. I remember having to do them um, for the podcast. Um, and he had, we spent about like 10 minutes just trying to get the right pitch for hello. Yeah. Is that yeah, why no, there's so it, many it, takes? Yes. There, are, there, there are so many takes away, but to be honest there, to be honest, it gets the best out of it. Like, no, as in there's oh, so yeah. many takes in the actual episode. Is it because he couldn't get one that he liked? Or is that? No, he, no, he got one he liked. It's just that in the end, he decided to add them all together and just repeat some of them. <laughs> yeah, just the essence of comedy. Sake. Fair enough. He also has a habit of um, using people's blooper lines without their knowledge, like Zegram's infamous Rudolph comment. Or I found this cookie. <laughs> so. Speaking of cookies, in the news this week, there are no cookies. Sorry to disappoint you. But if you are looking for something to indulge yourself a little, then may I direct you to Adepticon and Slanesh. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Uh, new- oh, I'm new so Keeper good of Secrets. At <laughs> that was a mighty fine segue. And yeah, the New Keeper of Secrets, like. Wow. Yeah, wow. That's an amazing looking model. Like, I've been on a bashedly good at bashing Slanesh. Like, I hate Slanesh as a rule of thumb. But I just want to take a second before I, I think, just pull a Kiri off and gush over the Keeper of Secrets. To just... Po- okay, steady on. To point out <laughs> why it's such a good idea that Slanesh is coming now. Because this is a release that's themed around Age of Sigma primarily. They're getting a new battle tome and they've been moving the plot forward with Slanesh. But they've been setting that um, sort of trigger up for... Over a year with the elves, with the Necroquake, with Corn, and now with this Forbidden Power expansion, which is coming up, which is something else they talked about at Adepticon, where things that were sealed away are getting out. So it makes perfect sense that Slanesh is getting out and going ballistic. And yeah, okay, that's just credit to the writing team for good forward planning, because this isn't just chucking out models yeah. to satisfy people. This is good writing. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is what is known as like evolving the setting, which is something that Age of Sigmar has actually been really damn good at. Like adding iterative ages to the game. It works. Yeah. And I'm happy that it works. And it worked so well that 40k straight up nicked everything. <laughs> but anyway. Well it showed it showed for a start that it's not an undo thing for them to be able to be like, you know what, let's let's push the setting forward a little bit. It can still be five minutes to midnight. It can just be more five minutes to midnight. Yeah, absolutely. And how about two minutes to midnight so we can have some Iron Maiden playing? <laughs> but interestingly, I think 40K's I don't think 40K is at five minutes to midnight anymore. That I this is a little bit abstract, but I feel like it's almost like one minute quarter one in the morning. It's one minute past. <laughs> like it's still utter hell. But there's a chance that the worst of it has it's still absolute hell, but the Great Rift is here now and they're learning to deal with it. Katie has fallen, but Terra has held. The Dark Imperium's a shitstorm. Sorry, language, sorry, YouTube. Um 
<laughs> Doggy Perry was a Can mess. you bleep that? <laughs> like, do we have to do we have to avoid YouTube's algorithm to catch that word now? Probably, considering that you know, demonetize you completely now for swearing now for purposes of comedic effect. It, it has <laughs> happened, yes. Um, so the Dark Imperium is a nightmare, but the Imperium is now in a position to deal with it. So as far as the Imperium is concerned, now they've got Gilliman back, which is something that I believe is something that the Chaos Gods didn't even plan for. Uh, there's a big long thread from Reddit got put in your Discord the other day, Ram. I had a read of that, um, about like the fact that Gilliman's return is so unexpected that... Maybe it isn't five minutes to midnight for the Imperium anymore. And maybe it's not for it's the eight, Eldari, eight because minutes? with Yvrain and the Incarn and Yanari. Mm. No, I mean, that that's an interesting point. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly like... It, it, it's, been, it's been a good way of, of maybe moving the clock a little bit, but also, as you say, with bringing Gilliman back and shaking up everything with the Yanari for the Eldar, um, just changing it around so that it is still five minutes to midnight, but it's also more, but it's also not as much. I don't know, like something similar. It's a shake up regardless. And that's kind of what's important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's so funny. I remember an old Animaticus episode um, where I had a quote of move the plot. Okay. No, not like that. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that quote, I remember um, because people were flipping out about gathering storm. And people have kind of, okay, yes, people don't all like Primaris, and people still think Cole's probably a bit of a Mary Sue character, even more so than Cass Sicarius. But. I don't think anyone's ever gone that far. You know what I mean, though? Like, Cole and the Primaris were unpopular, and to an extent, kind of still are. But people have come round to this new setting now. Well, this updated setting where the plot has slightly changed and the setting has slightly changed, but it's still very, very grim dark. So the no, not like that's uh, actually were just kind of panicking because they didn't like change or something like that. Actually, just going back to Call very briefly, considering that the Horus Heresy is over, now we're on to Siege of Terror and Call's only made one appearance in one novel, it's making me wonder, will he actually make an appearance in the Siege of Terror series? I imagine he will. Like, Probably him- just a cameo. It, 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 it might be a bit of an extended cameo, but the idea that he shows up in Wolfsbane and then um, disappears and then is gone until the M41. sorry gone, gone until <laughs> gone until the Gathering Storm. I, I think it's a bit too much of a gulf. He'll either show up in Siege of Terror or he will show up in the Scouring novel series that we all know is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, and that I'm very much looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, they have sort of laid out why he does what he does because Gilliman gives him his briefing um, after the heresy once he's back uh, to go and create the Primaris and create the armor of fate for when Gilliman cops it because Gilliman just is a bit paranoid about dying apparently. Um, so they have set call up a little bit, but they do need to flesh him out in that time before as much as he's had his mind wiped, keep that in mind. So he might not remember what goes on. I mean, in fairness, out of all the Gathering Storm characters, he's certainly more fleshed out than, you know, Voldus. Yeah, I think Voldus, Voldus was just there to fill out a box. <laughs> Grandmaster third model. Like, seriously, it's that like, could have been Drago. It, it could have been. Or it could have been, you know, someone else. Don't know, but it could have been someone else. It could have been a custodian character or something. It could have been Trajan Valoris. Uh, the Custodes weren't released from Terror at the time of the Triumph of the Primarch forming in Terran Crusade, so no, but yeah, oh, I think you know what I mean. There could have been someone other than Voldus, because what did Voldus actually do apart from just like, I'm here too? Um, <laughs> he was very, he was very much that kind of like, hello, I am also here. I'm part of a Triumvirate because a Triumvirate has to have three people and they only had two for this box until I got created. <laughs> I did. I did talk about Volus in a lot of videos. Let me see if he did anything. Uh, uh. He looked. He stood next to the Primarch and looked cool doing it. But that's about uh, well, it. He's apparently the most powerful psyker the Grey Knights have got. Um, but that's like all I have on him. He's so powerful. He made everyone forget about him. <laughs> Adeptus Redactus. <laughs> Anyway, that was a bit of a, a tangent. Let's get back to Slanesh. <laughs> yes, new mask model. 
the new mask model is great. As I said on Twitter, her uh, like high, high tights, whatever you want to call them, seem stockings. to be stockings. Cool, we'll go with that. Seem to be literally her skin being pulled tight, and that is the most goddamn Hellraiser thing ever, and I love it. Yeah, I mean, yes. go on. I was just going to say, um, I do love the fact it looks, you know, it actually looks like it's dancing compared to the old model, which just like, I'm holding a baton. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it actually looks like she's dancing. So I was like, yes. I mean, I look at if, the models that they've shown off. Like the Keeper of Secrets is ridiculous. Uh, the Celesque Demon Prince Herald combo tag team is very clever, um, and the mask is exactly what you'd expect the mask to be. Like what? Uh, what I what I adore about this new range is that I mean, not first, like not only is it absolutely just stunning. Um, but they have managed to not only stay incredibly consistent with the lore, but incredibly consistent with the overall Slaneshi vibe, while at the same time pushing it into a place that we just simply haven't seen before. And mm. that is challenging. Like, that, that is not an easy job to both be entirely respectful of everything that's come before and then take it into places that are so new, like, it leaves me... Like, that, that greater demon just kind of left me a little bit speechless because I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, I'm just impressed with the new Keeper of Secrets that they've stayed true to the original Keeper of Secrets, you know, the whole gimp cow thing, but actually made, managed to make it look both animalistic yet graceful at the same time. It and also fun. disturbingly androgynous. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, just, it takes everything Slanesh does and is and rolls it all together and the one thing that I think, I maybe it's just me, but the Keeper of Secrets and Celesque, or particularly the Demon Prince half of Celesque, look almost like they could exist. Because, like, particularly the Keeper of Secrets, looks like it came straight out of Greek myth. That like, you can just imagine this bovine, minotaur-style creature with uh, extra limbs and a sword and shield that this variant can have. Like, it just... It feels real enough to sort of reflect the fact that it's created by the ideas of a mortal-induced god. It, mm-hmm. it it just feels real enough, and I think that's something that Slanesh can do. Yeah, that, there's an un, there's an uncanniness to it that is just stunning. Like it was, it works in its favor so well. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is, I think that with the design cues, they've obviously noticed the fact or remembered the fact that Slanesh is intrinsically tied in 40k to the Eldari and AOS to the Elves. Because as you'd expect, the aesthetic, if you sort of looked at every piece in a vacuum and took everything demonic off it, looks like it could have been an Eldari device or an Elven weapon. So they've kept those design cues as well. It, It just... It just works, honestly. Like mm-hmm. the only thing I don't like is the endless spells, because I, I don't know. I just feel like the one with the whip and cat and nine tails tongue is just a bit derpy, and I'm not. I sure. like the giant mirror one. The, one the mirror, mirror one's mirror interesting. The, the mirror yeah. is the mirror a war machine? The it, one with the two demonettes on either side. We don't know. Um, yeah. Current consensus is it will be a war machine because if you notice carefully, the demonette attendants I'll go with, are wearing masks, something that most demonettes don't do. And the other place that I've seen a mirrored thing where its attendants wear masks is the Bloodrack Shrine of the Daughters of Cain, where mm-hmm. the attendants of the shrine wear little reflective masks so that the Bloodrack Medusa doesn't just kill them by looking at them. <laughs> because back in the days when it was built for the Dark Elves, the Bloodrack Medusas were spiteful as heck. So the mirror was behind them, so they didn't turn around and kill the Dark Elves, and the attendants had mirrored sort of glasses so that it didn't kill them. That's why it's always important to show up to work with your safety equipment. <laughs> Just so, just so. Now, these... These models are just a a, a stunningly impressive improvement on what had been a range that, to me, has kind of felt a little bit neglected. When I first got into the hobby back in 2002, they were updating the Fantasy Chaos range and a lot of the demons along with it, and you had uh, Jess Goodwin's like marvelous demonette models, as well as that... I think now iconic Slaneshi Lord on on a demonic mount. 
all of which, you know, not a pretty heavy metal looking stuff, but not exactly in line with what you'd want to sell teenagers, like, honestly. Um, yes. Even though like, I have always preferred, I've always felt that those old Demonette models are just inherently superior to the plastic kit that they came out with. I, I appreciate the aesthetic that they moved into, but it personally wasn't for me. Um, but this very much feels like a kind of return to form overall. Yeah. Yeah. While and also, while also simultaneously sidestepping the issue with uh, the Sex, issue. Sex, rock and roll. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because like they've got the noise marine for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Like Mortal Slash can go for that, but the demons, because they're sort of embodiments of everything, kind of have to almost t- temper themselves. And you know what this does, perhaps? Because I'm not going to collect Slanesh. I never will. I'm not a Slanesh fan. But this gives me hope for the Sororitas range, because Slanesh, if they'd have gone all in on that sort of old school hyper-sexualized, over-the-top aesthetic on the Slanesh range, which they could have absolutely done and people would have still lapped it up because it still fits Slanesh, then it would make me think that the Sisters range was still going to play up some of the things that became infamous with the Sisters of Battle. Mm-hmm. So it stay, the Slanesh range stays true to its roots, but is done in a tasteful and suitable manner for a full audience and i'm thinking that because they've done it here with something that's i'll honestly say more dangerous than the sisters of battle range that they'll be able to do the sisters of battle range in the same way yeah the sisters of battle range is something that i'm i'm kind of watching fairly eagerly um just to see i think everyone is to be fair well, of course <laughs> like I, I don't think there's anyone out there that isn't like very very eagerly anticipating what's going to come out with it but everything i not Hmm? We've been waiting 22 years for Plastic Sisters. Just give them to us. <laughs> exactly. But everything that I've seen so far is, again, in the same way as Slanesh, keeping very true to previous aesthetics, history, lore, while also pushing it into new places. Like they're, taking, yeah, the they're taking their time and they're putting a lot of work into it. And God, I, do, I appreciate the hell out of that. Yeah, the Battle Sister Bulletin articles that show sort of the design inspirations and how they've been building the Sisters range has been, whilst it's not given much away, has been quite insightful that they're still going to do what the Sisters do, oh, but yeah. they're obviously updating it and keeping it fresh and adding new iconography and recycling the old and yeah. And if you want a Sisters Army, then go fill out the community survey because you might just win one. <laughs> yeah, that would be a prize. It, oh, yeah. That is the prize. So what else has come out through the Adepticon? We got Apocalypse, haven't we? Yes, uh, 40k Apocalypse with movement trays, apparently. No, yeah, they are there. They're like clear plastic things. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, 40k movement trays. It's just like... I said it's been talked about for like decades, but never actually officially implemented as far as I can tell. No, no they, they, had, they had movement I mean, trays for fantasy back in the day when everything was square or rectangular, but... They, I don't think... They, did they have official ones for fantasy? Oh, yeah. I don't yeah, think people yeah, used no, them. Oh, yeah, absolutely did, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And War of the Ring had them as well. Yes. Not before that game. So. Yes, it did. Even though they were on round bases. Like, I, yeah, I do remember that. For, for the Lord of the Rings range did have some movement trays. Um, but, yeah, never for 40k... So I, I, don't Which, know, I don't know why, I don't know necessarily why they're coming in right now. I have something, I have, excuse me, I have my suspicions that it's probably to do with the kind of fairly heavy proliferation of like cut M, laser cut MDM, MDF uh, movement trace that we've seen or that I've certainly seen in like local, my local hobby store. Um, they've become very, very popular for fantasy and have been begun kind of encroaching into 40k recently where since... Since um, kind of bunching up or spreading out squads isn't as important in the rules as it may have once been. I mean, pie plates are gone, I suppose. Um, but I think the reason that they're adding movement trays now is because they say in the article it's about bringing these mega battles into an evening. So they want Apocalypse games to be done in a day. And I'm sure you're all aware, Apocalypse games of the past could take a weekend. Yeah. Or a week. Mm-hmm. So they're, t- they're talking about it on a scale of not focusing on units, 
but formation. So I'm wondering if as a sort of game mechanic, they will say you buy a formation of units and control what that does combined as opposed to controlling the individual units just to speed the game along. I would imagine that that's kind of the only way they can go with it because I, I've, I played, I think, two Apocalypse games in my life um, and that was enough <laughs> because they were just so long. Like an average, an average 40K game might take a few hours. These ones did go on for like basically the entire day. And at the end, it was just essentially like a punishing ordeal of a thing to go through. So if they're, if they're attempting to shorten down the game to, as you say, a few hours, I am entirely for that. And I do not really care how they do it. Yeah, they do say they built it from the ground up, so it's not a case of, oh, here's the 40k rule set, let's just tweak it a bit. It sounds like they're actually going to build this from the bottom, so maybe this is their way of rebooting Epic? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have Adeptus Titanicus, but they're. I think they've been pretty clear that they're not intending to expand that out to anything beyond uh, just Titan Legions versus Titan Legions, like no Xenos, uh, Titan's going to be yeah, involved. It's, and it's certainly no like, little little um, little space marines to go along with it. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, they don't give any dates in this article about anything. Uh, <laughs> but I do like the fact that the Apocalypse box is a Vortex Missile Munitorum crate. Yeah. I approve of that. I very much approve of that too. Nice little design there. Yeah. Uh, they also go on for 40k to talk about the fact that they're going to be doing other war zones. So, sort of Vigilus again, but in different places and i'll be honest i want one thing out of this new gaskell yeah you and uh you and every single orc player on the planet for a minute i um, misheard you were yeah. saying you want newcastle <laughs> <sighs> no no um, one newcastle. but yeah Poor newcastle. but yeah the war zones will be interesting because i think warzone armageddon is obvious because armageddon got a big reboot yes i think They've got an opportunity to do Warzone Octarius, although that war's kind of exploded out now. Um, they could go back and do Warzone Ultramar if they wanted to, um, or Warzone Macrag, or Ish, whatever's going on in the, the bloody wars over there. So the Plague um, is in kind of make a almost historical setting Plague Wars supplement? Yeah, that would work. Mm -hmm. But they've already done the Death Guard to death, so... But yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do, but I think the main thing they've got to do with this sort of series of war zones is flesh out the new state of play um, as to why the Dark Imperium, or what the Dark Imperium's like right now. What's it like in the... I still call it the Light Imperium, I know that's not its name. <laughs> um, what, what's it like in Imperium Sanctus now that the Great Rift is there? Why is it such and such a way uh, some worlds obviously still are affected by the blackness they're not say Turner because I don't know warp chicanery um, so it'll be interesting to see how they do it because I want them to flesh that stuff out and then bring it to the heroes rather than do it as hey we want to bring this hero back here let's shoehorn him into something I agree um, there's got to be I mean they've shown that they've got a pretty deft hand these days uh, at just working newer releases of kind of updated models into Warzone supplements. Um, the Abaddon one being the perfect example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping for a new Gazgol as much as anyone. Um, it's not also uh, a wild idea to suggest that every range is probably going to get some sort of big centerpiece model. Because um, those models, I presume, shift units pretty well. So, if you can sell a one hundred dollar Gasgill model, happy days to you. Vect, Vect. Do you know what we need as well? Shadow um, Sun or, or Shadow Sun might get Avatar mm. of Cain. Farsight. I've worked with that Farsight model. It's cool, but isn't that the second be Farsight model though? So he doesn't really need another one. Just yet. I don't. Yeah, I don't think Farsight necessarily needs it, to be. That updated. was the third Calgar model. <laughs> That's very true, but he literally got upgraded. <laughs> yes, I know Primanius was very different, but he's still Calgar the Third. I mean, how many Eldrads have there been? Two? Two. Three? Just two. Okay, fine. 
It would be pretty hilarious to see a Gulliman scale Eldrad. <laughs> Eldrad had his new model, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he was in Wait the Dead. Yeah, that, uh, that old box set. But, but we still need a new avatar, avatar of Kane. We that do. isn't a Forge World Badly. model. <laughs> yep, I'd agree with that. Yeah, that one's that one is a bit of a necessity. Yeah, and the, the Daughters of Cain one is a bit small. And the new ga- and the um, the new Gaskell is also a very a very uh, obvious contender. <laughs> he needs to be the size yeah. of um, the Primaris Dreadnought. He needs to be that big. Oh, easy. If we're throwing names into the hat here, then I'm going to say Silent King, Vect, Yeriel, um would, would probably be all useful ones. Obviously, Silent King and Vect don't have rules, and they need to be given rules. But... Well, in fact, all you got to do is just take his old third edition rules. There you go. Jobs are good. Mm-hmm. Back when he was writing his Dice of Destruction. And when stat lines were completely different. Yes. <laughs> but it was I, awesome because he was just sitting in the middle of a raid and just sitting on top of his throne with his little pistol going, yeah, I'm in charge, bitch. <laughs> that model was... Um, well, it hasn't, it think... hasn't aged well. Uh, no. <laughs> the entire Dark Eldar range from those days has not aged well. Uh, you don't have to tell me. Dark Eldar were very technically my first 40k army, and that the first Warhammer product I ever bought was a third oh, yeah. was oh, a third it. edition Dark Eldar box set with those oh, bikes back, and back those cavalites. Was the size of Imperial Guard uh, troopers instead of being the size of like dreadnoughts, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Um, Oh, do you remember the original T- Talos Pain Engine? That was <laughs> oh, that thing. That thing was a nightmare of cut fingers, swear words I shouldn't have known at that age, <laughs> and parts of my body super glued together because that thing would not stay together, no matter how much glue you put on it. I mean, it was in fairness, yeah. at least nightmare. you weren't using, you know. Yeah, putting together the old metal bloodthirster with its massive metal wings with tiny little indentations to put the wings on. Not actual slots, indentations. Yeah, no, so my friend, uh, to, a friend of mine... You had to pin it. Yeah, a friend, no of mine, a friend of mine who uh, played 3.5 edition Chaos Space Marines, the best list they've ever had, um, had a bloodthirster that was his absolute pride and joy. And he, unlike me, had access to a pin vice. So I was able to pin those wings together, and I was able to marvel that they stayed on. <laughs> uh, that bloodthirster, that bloodthirster was just a, just an absolute nemesis. I hated that thing. And you go back even further, back when the models were made of lead, so they would kill you. <laughs> yeah, and if you go back even further than that, they had models made of asbestos. Truly was a dark age of technology. <laughs> but the Vect, a Vect updated model would be great. Gazgol, obviously. Maybe Shadow Sun if she gets a huge new battle suit. Um, who else? Who else was on the list? Silent King, Silent King or Imotech. Again, maybe getting a bit of an upgrade. Yeah, um, Imotech will be the one who gets it, probably. Or maybe Trazen, because he's been showing up a little bit in other lore. Trazen is uh, a new model, because this model shit. His, his model isn't the best, but I don't He's like see... hunched over like Eagle. I don't see. Tra- like, I don't like the hunch, to be honest. And that's that's actually what I was going to say is that the stature of Trazen is not something that like puts me off. I think he actually works better if he's just a kind of a bit of a regular sized dude. He's much more. I'm fun not, I'm that not way. saying make him big, but I'm just saying that he looks very. Bland. I mean, yeah. For a special character, he just looks so meh. But the thing is, one of the temptations when you've got models like that is to put them in quote unquote hero pose. Um, and going back to the Keeper of Secrets again, like they haven't done that with the Keeper of Secrets. So they can do understated poses that make the models look like a badass. So they Oh yeah. So, yeah. Maybe we'll see. Uh, in other news this week, um Horror Heresy Book Eight Malevolence goes on pre order at time of recording tomorrow. Or today rather in fact Oh, I want it so badly, but it is a lot of Canadian dollars. Eighty pounds sterling. Or you can yeah, get yourself the sanguineous with that's the That's a Primark. Eighty pounds sterling is uh, a number in Canadian dollars. It isn't actually a number, it's just a scream. I'm also gonna say Mark I mean, Weekly didn't quid, see the price of sanguineous, it's like hundred and twenty five pounds. <laughs> 
But it uh, it looks like an absolutely gorgeous book, as always. And I'm not going to lie, I'm very happy that the whole Horus Heresy and Forge World thing is kind of back on track and has really kind of come out of the gate swinging after um, after Alan Bly's like, very, very sad passing. Hmm. And hey, we actually find a way to care about white scars. Maybe. Possibly. Oh, don't be stupid. No one's going to be able to care about white scars. Uh, excuse, oh, excuse me, the both of you. White scars have been something to care about ever since Scars and Path of Heaven. Thanks to oh, Path of Heaven was that a that terrible they... book. <laughs> Path of Heaven was not a terrible book because it was written by Chris Ray, who cannot write terrible books, and the White Scars are awesome, and Jagged Eye Khan is one of the best Primarchs out there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry but the first, well, the first 80% of Primark. Path of Heaven was a boring snooze fest. It only got interesting once they reached the Dark Glass space station, which is like, you know, when you're nearly at the end of the book. The rest of the time, it was a boring trodge. And the other problem is that when I think about Primarchs, like I used to, I can rattle off all the Primarchs, but a while ago I couldn't. And the one that I always missed when I was double-checking my list was Jagtai. I don't have a reason why. You know, I just could not remember him. It's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating that you say that because I just finished, um, I just finished the audiobook of uh, Jack Attack Khan, Warhawk of Chigoris, um, and there is literally an extract at the start of the book which tells of a fable of a scholar <laughs> talking to the emperor on Terra about doing records of all of the Primarchs and their lives. <laughs> it's you. It's me. Chris Ray wrote me into a book. That is the reality that I've accepted and no one can change it <laughs> in my mind. Um, but he, he, the, the conversation talks about how, um, the scholar is basically just like, yeah, there's not a whole lot about Jack and Ty out there and everyone kind of forgets him. He seems to be pretty unknowable. And the emperor is like, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it. That's basically what he is. So- I mean, he doesn't really have much in the way of quirks. I mean, he's not like Ferris Manus, you know, who can crush laser beams and eat sand. <laughs> eat the sand. That's canon, though. That's the best, that was the best thing about that book. Just seeing that. His diet, his diet consisted entirely of sand. We lost it for a full morning when that, when, when you showed up with that extract. That was one of the best things I've ever seen. I, I can't remember who sent it, but someone, um, on Twitter tagged, um, Alf Buse had a picture of Ferris Manus eating a sandcastle saying, you know, oh, the Imperial Fist would make such good cakes. <laughs> Um, you're, you're right though, in the sense that Jagatai doesn't have a lot of flaws ne- necessarily, because he just, he's just a dude who really enjoys a simple life and kind of just wants to be let live his simple life. And that's kind of what I find so fascinating about him. And in the artwork for Horus Heresy Book A, he looks like Jason Momoa for some reason. <laughs> it, it, there, there are shades, shades of Jason in that, yes. Yeah, I've seen a few people saying, what the hell did they do to Jagatai? Why did they shave his mustache? Where's his big lightning bolt tattoo? I, I actually quite like that portrait of him, to be honest. I won't lie. It's, it's, it, it captures that kind of uh, arch nobility that he has. Um, oh, yeah. That, get, that understated mean, but, nobility. But why do they shave his big, iconic Fu Manchu mustache? Because uh, exactly that, like the Fu Manchu mustache is kind of a bit of a non-starter these days. And we want to move also, away from the whole... We want to move away from for his Primarchs novel. He had it there. Yeah, yeah. And again, we. but I don't blame them for kind of wanting to move away from the white scars are literally the only Asians in the 40k universe thing. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Also, while we're talking about Book 8, did you see the list of, like, special characters like, in the contest, eventually, like, about who's getting like, rules and all that stuff? Because, um, Ascalon's not there. Um, which... Ascalon's not there, but... Amit well, is... is, because we saw his model. No, Amit's not either. It's... I forget who it is, and I can't remember if the image has been posted anywhere I can find it. No, I know the, I know the dude you're talking about. some blood angel. I'd... 
It's some Blood Angel they couldn't remember. I didn't recognize like at all. But this this has always been a bit of the this has always been a bit of the disparity between how Forge World is approaching the heresy versus how the Black Library is is approaching the heresy. There is obviously the shared canon between the two of them, but Forge World have had a tendency to be like, okay, we are going to include a named established character, and then we're going to include one more that we're going to uh, make up ourselves. Or in the case of some legions, we're going to make up two characters that you've never heard of because we just don't particularly feel like using the ones that the Black Library have created. Like the Alpha, me- for the Alpha Legion, they created Armelius, Dynad, and Exodus, neither of which have ever actually appeared in anything to do with the Alpha Legion in the Black Library series. That reminds me with um, with Burning of Prospero when they introduced um, Giga Felhand, and I swear to God he was originally designed as Bjorn. And then someone realized he wasn't actually there. Oh, shit. Uh, call him Giger instead. Oh, you know, I hadn't even considered that. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, that could have been a thing. That could have totally been a thing. Sorry, I can't I didn't hear a word of that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying that that could be, that could totally be a thing. <laughs> he was just like, well, wait, oh, we are, wait, wait, he wasn't there? Are we sure? Oh, uh... <laughs> Because you think out of the Space Wars characters, you think, you know, Bjorn would, you know, have a model considering, you know, it's fucking Bjorn. Eh, give it a bit. There's still time. But yeah, um, the Sanguinius model, it's like £125 with a special diorama base. Holy flip. But the diorama base is so literally him, like, impaling a demon, so it looks cool. That is, it is a I gorgeous know, model. but that's 50% on top of Magnus, who already had an amazing scenic base. But he didn't have a yeah, demon. No one cares about Magnus. Why? <laughs> I care about I'm Magnus. I'm sorry, I had to do it. I care about No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> mm, okay, so what else do we want to talk about from Adepticon? Uh, oh! Let's let's, let's mention the painting thing that we have no idea quite what it is yet because that trailer was just brilliant. That trailer was fifty shades, fifty shelves of grey. That trailer was a stroke of genius. (laughs) And I love the like comments. I think it was from Instagram on the trailer. So why is Duncan not in this trailer? Because if you saw Duncan Rhodes in a suit, it would create a second birth of (laughs) Slanesh. The world cannot handle that much raw animal (laughs) magnitude. Magnetism, even. Either or. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised no one made a comment by him not wearing a suit jacket, just two thin coats. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> uh, 10 out of 10. Um, oh. What's the bet that this is Games Workshop moving into airbrushes? That's the common consensus. Mm. The only... I, mean, the, 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 I can see why it's a consensus. It's... Here, you want to batch paint your models? Cool. That or it's it's either airbrushes or literal vats of null oil. <laughs> Just like the army painter tins, but they're delivered in like barrels of oil. Just like cartoonishly large barrels shipped up to your place. Question: Don't Forge would already sell um, airbrush? Uh, so um, airbrush paint. They sell airbrush paint, but so does Citadel. They have their airline for the paints. They don't sell airbrushes, right. though. Right, okay. Or do they? Just no, I'm pretty sure they don't. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's my theory about that. We'll see how it goes. I'm sure they're going to make a big deal of it in a few weeks once Adepticon is kind of cooled down. Um, They'll probably make a big deal about it, but it won't be appearing in a coming soon page because Skate have got rid of those. R.I.P. <sighs> um, what was the other thing about Adepticon that was cool? Yeah, Age of Sigmar Warcry. Oh, these models. Chaos Dwarves, Chaos Ogres, Furies, Weed Vulture Thingamick Jeff Chickens! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got a vibe of like, uh, it's kind of like if you crossed the Vultures from like Lion King with um, the Razor, do- not Razor Dog, Razor Gore, the giant pig thingy. Um, that, that's what I get as a vibe of that thing. And, um, I'm trying to remember see... when there was a vulture in the Lion King. I don't even remember. No, the vulture. buzzards. Sorry. Oh, no, but hang on. I'm thinking of the bloody buzzards in the Jungle Book. Hang on. I'm I was so going to say, what <laughs> movie are you watching? <laughs> right. I'll, 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 no, stop. Move on. Move on. Move on. But the buzzards in, in the Jungle Book. So 
This just monologue is basically Walker. one of the Beatles, but as a bird. Just talk about Warcry. <laughs> it's like, we're going to be talking about Warcry. Um, oh, right, lads. My name's Ringo. Oh, the Chaos Dwarves. I'll put it on the fridge. Oh, look, there's some there's organs Duncan, too. He's painting the models. <laughs> oh, several factions. Bloody hell, lads. Um, They're all in the strawberry fields. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you think there's going to be some other dwarves in here? Um... <laughs> We could do an entire podcast like that. No, uh, <laughs> what I don't know about, like, what I'm unclear about with Warcry is, is it Age of Sigmar Necromunda? Because I think that's what they're going to do it's with it. The vibe because it's the It's made by the team. Yeah, because it's made by the people who make uh, Underworlds and Kill Team. And Underworld is going nowhere because that's got Karadron. <laughs> Just got added to it by Adepticon. Um, uh, so excuse me, I'm excuse me. Was that a diss on the Karadron Overlords? No, I said Caradron had been added to it by Adepticon. I said nothing about the Caradron mm. at all. They suck in the game, but they're a quite cool faction in terms of I know, they, they totally not. suck in the game, and I really want them to get updated because I have half of a Skyfleet put together that I'm not, that I've totally shelved until they get better rules. Yeah, well, the Fire Slayers just got re updated with their new thingy with jibs, so hopefully the Caradron will get there eventually. They're not next because Sylvaneth will probably be next because they're in a box set with Gloom Spite anyway. Yes. So I think Warcry is probably going to be kind of like a kill teamy necromundary mordheimy sort of thing of these factions fighting to get to the all points uh, to win Archaeon's favor because that's the idea of these iron golem lot because they believe they are destined being from the realm of metal to forge the weapons of the I mean I certainly hope that they go with the necromunda route for that um I have one of the things that I've uh, really enjoyed about Games Workshop these past few years is their ability to really push into how do you want to play? How do you want to paint? How do you want to model? What kind of a hobby do you want? We're going to cover all of the bases for you. Like, it's a phenomenal strategy for them, um, at least, pers- at least personally, because with all of the different game systems, you can just find one that kind of fits your game. Like, if you came from X-Wing or Star Wars Armada and you want something that's a bit more tactical, balanced, and a few mo- and a low model count, cool, there's Adeptus Titanicus for you. If you want skirmish-only games because you don't want to have an investment for a full army, Necromunda, uh, Warhammer Underworlds, and now Warcry. Like, they're covering all of their bases, and it's, it's very, very smart. And cool, because I've picked up Shadespire and Night Vault. I've had great fun games with all of them and doing that has led me like i'm right now on my right now out there on my hobby bench is some chaos dwarves for age of sigmar the thorns of the briar queen and uh the stormcast from night vault and i'm getting to paint i'm getting to paint the thorns of the briar queen in cool night haunt colors and i'm getting to do stonecast for the stormcast and it's it's fucking great and it's allowing me to cover a whole bunch of bases while also um you know still working on armies yeah and and that's that's my rant about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't get half of that because my internet died. Uh, but the interesting thing about the whole scaling up and covering all their bases is that Kill Team is the perfect transition game. Because Kill Team, at its core, is a game mm-hmm. where you have a squad of whatever. That's it. You have a squad of whatever, and they do stuff. But then they've added in the Leaders expansion. So you naturally build up and add a commander to that force then they've added kill team elites so you add in sort of heavier forces and before you know it just playing kill team particularly if you're playing a faction like um adeptus mechanicus you have like two different kill teams you can have like a 1000 point army just by playing kill team and you don't even realize yeah, before you know it yeah <laughs> or you do yeah <laughs> and you're just like well okay there's there, there is my Entry level drug that has gotten the, me hooked on the, the hard stuff. The only thing about um, Underworlds, and I'm sure, well, I don't know if you can attest to this, but I have uh, Zarbag's Gits, and the plastic is, by comparison to most GW plastics, it's crap. It's garbage. I'm sorry, it is. It's awful. In in what way? In that it just, it's that coloured plastic, and it just, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't feel as detailed. Uh, because it's not as fine and precise. It doesn't paint quite so nicely. I mean, it could be me. that they wanted to keep costs down for that. I don't know about wrong that. Pre- about it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, they, um, if they're trying to keep costs down with that particular like range. The only quibble that I have with that, like, I, I found that I've got like Thorns of the Briar Queen from Night Vault, and I find that range just 
pretty actually stunning. Some of those models are just absolutely gorgeous. Oh, they look the lovely. Only... It's just that the plastic just naff, well, and they well, don't the go into their the... bases very well. Yeah, the quibble I have with the plastic, with the with the quick fit things, is that obviously you're going to compromise on something if you just want a game that people can just take it out, put everything together, and then be done with it. Because that's obviously what they're shooting for. Like, they're going after the board game market. Um, but the push-fit plastic can be annoying because it can be very hard to get rid of those lines that they have. Like, there are a lot of... Along the mold lines, it can be very hard to get those things to sync up. And there's a few models that I have that have very large, like, rents in their pauldrons or shoulders, and it's kind of annoying. Oh, yeah. And it's not just the Night Vault plastics that are culpable for this. Uh, despite the fact that they're made from, like, the grey plastic, the Soul Wars plastics. Oh, my goodness. I I had I, I had to glue my bloody castigators' heads on because I couldn't get them to snap in. It was just awful. Mm -hmm. um, but the it, the difference with those and the Shade Spire plastic, it's just that it's the different type of plastic. I don't know about it, just, but it just feels off. I don't know why. And I don't mean to mean this as a, a, a segment of Let's Bash GW's design team, because my goodness, the designs to get those models out are always fantastic. But something about those Underworlds plastics just doesn't do it for me. And I don't know what it is, and I don't know why. No, yeah. I can't personally attest to it, but I don't entirely blame you for taking <laughs> taking on bridge with some of the designs there. Yep. Um, what else is there from this? Uh, Forbidden Power, we don't really know much about that yet, although it's got one of the most awesome looking ferrymen of the dead I've ever seen. Uh, Fire Slayers with their magmic invocations, because who doesn't want a giant magic salamander? And uh, the box set, which we think is going to be Silver Earth versus Gloom Spite. Yep, that's, that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. It was a that good Adepticon. Adep yeah, I, I was concerned about Adepticon this year because last year's Adepticon had the Ideneth and the Sororitas as its two big headlines. It's like, how do you top that? Or even how do you match that? And, Easy. Well, New Primaris Lieutenant model. <laughs> Uh, I think that I think that that Primaris Lieutenant model can finally die now that one is literally dead on Abaddon space, and also that they lent into it, which was wonderful. Oh, and there was also that new Librarian Terminator as well. Yes, that's uh, going to be available at some events throughout next year, I believe. It looks good though. Yeah, it's not Primaris though, right? It's just <coughs> no. regular old Marine. Regular librarian termy. That's kind of surprising to me because I had the distinct impression that they were kind of phasing out regular marines. Or are they? Or are they? Mm, the, the plot thickens. Or thinnens. <laughs> the plot too thin coats doesn't quite work, does it? Mm, never mind. I'll tell you what also didn't work. Um, the Black Library and Games Workshop website when Solar War was released. Uh-oh, brace yourself. Oh, dear. <coughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, as you know, when Solar War dropped, um, the F Black Library website did not actually have the book available to buy for a good 45 minutes after it was supposed to be released. Um, on Games Workshop site, it sold out within about six minutes. Yay. Now, what happened was, on Black Library, when people finally managed to get onto it, uh, people were scalping the shit out of it. Which? Sorry, but... You want I to redo very... that? <laughs> <laughs> people were scalping the crap out of it. Like, people were selling copies of Solo War on eBay for at least 250 quid a pop now. And it's at the point where Black Library authors have been going on Twitter saying, if you scalp this, then, you know... 200, 250, uh, 250 quid a pop, that's almost one xenology. <laughs> yes, I Ch am salty about how I don't own that book. Chuck, for me, I bought mine for 45. <laughs> uh. You know what the worst part about this is? Sorry to do a little bit of a tangent. Before I came back to Canada from being in Ireland, I sold my hardback copy of the collected Libra Chaotica. 
Oh, and you never sell the Libra Chaotic, huh? I know. It's one of it is one of my like. I was not young enough to have made a decision that stupid. But <laughs> how much I paid for my hardback copy of Libra Chaotica? It's going to be like fifteen quid or something. Close twenty. Oh, very nice. I it, it, the salve of the salve of this all is that out there in my bookcase is an original nineteen ninety. Uh, like maybe third print run edition of Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader that I bought for literally five dollars here. So nice, and that's five Canadian, which is about I don't know a pound fifty. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, going back to my yeah, solar, solar war, war tangent. Um, right, <laughs> a well bloody deserved run. I'll tell you that now, considering. Right. So I, I will say. Um, I did manage to get hold of a copy, and I owe a huge thank you to Disharmonia for actually getting me the direct link before it actually went live. I don't know how she managed to get the Yay. link, but God bless you. God bless you, Disharmonia, and glad to see you got a copy as well. Um, <laughs> but they knew how popular it was going to be. They hyped it up the night before by saying, hey, this is going to sell out first. You might want to buy it. And then the site goes down. Um, I got charged multiple times for it because when you clicked place order, it would authenticate the payment and kick you straight back to place order. Oh. So I got charged multiple times for one copy, but luckily when I contacted Games Workshop about it, they did refund it to me, so can't complain there. Now, Uh, it should be stated that Black Library have realised that they got this one very, very wrong and have changed things accordingly. So now I believe you can only have one order per order, I suppose. Yes, yeah. uh, future uh, limited editions for the Siege of Terror series will only be available on Games Workshop site rather than Black Library, and mm-hmm. it'll be limited to one per order. Not one per account, one per order. So people can order multiple copies, but they have to do it one at a time. So just However, you- there have been casualties. Yes, Black Library got rid of the coming soon page. Why? <laughs> How move, the hell are we meant to say. plan for our future purpose, p- future purchases? I mean, they said, oh, but we'll announce it on the Warhammer community. Yeah, you announced it 24 hours before. How are we meant to put away £40 for a special edition with 24 hours notice? Simple. You just have to have a, com- a completely ongoing and persistent black library fund in your bank account. <laughs> Or a piggy bank <laughs> labelled Smash in case of uh, fiction emergency. Yeah. It just it makes it very, very annoying in regards to trying to plan out to buy special editions. Like, if you want to buy, you know, the Conrad Curse Primarchs novel, which is the next one, good luck finding out when it's actually on sale, because no one knows. Not even the author knows when it's on sale. Uh, <laughs> it's just... They maybe what like are, have they have they gotten rid of the coming soon entirely, or are they kind yeah, of rejigging they, how they're planning this out? They've they've, they've gotten rid of it completely. Now hmm. they are putting out Black Library newsletters, which is something that they are doing. So yeah, and they'll tell you so, that, so they'll tell you when the book's released. You know, ten minutes after it's been released. <laughs> but we don't know yet if that newsletter will include a coming soon feature. I mean, it, they did for the Solar War one, saying so like, "Hey, the Solar Wars, you know, it's available to buy." It's like it sold out twenty minutes ago. I trend towards optimism with this, only because um, Games Workshop have been very much going in the more openness and more te- and more like teasing more notification of what's on the horizon since the CEO changeover. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm optimistic about what they might do, although I do feel that it is a bit of a bizarre decision to get rid of a coming soon page. Unless they're just, unless they're currently in the midst of kind of redoing what they've actually got going in the range for now. I don't know. Speculation. That's all I can do. Because yeah, I know a few people asked on the um, the Black Library Facebook page um, if it was just down temporarily or if it's gone for good, and they said it is gone for good. Ah. Well then. Um, which has led to a campaign with quite a lot of people emailing Black Library saying, "Bring back the coming soon page." <laughs> Well, I mean, oh, the the stuff that I've seen about it has been universally what the hell, so <laughs> I don't understand it. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think people really want another debacle like with Solar Wars saying, hey, there's this book coming out tomorrow and we're going to announce when it's on sale 20 minutes after it's sold out. However, sometimes Universal what the hells do not get responded to. That is that is a, a thing we should note. As much as GW has improved, not everything gets reversed because people tell it to. And my internet's being stupidly disconnecting today. Yeah, there's been. Yeah, mine's been patchy as hell. Is is it all because you're trying to connect to a dude in Canada? No, no. it was bad last week when we. I'm just gonna, I'm just going to blame on the fact that Black Library got rid of their coming soon page. It's all their fault. Indeed. It's a side effect of the Solar War. It's a side effect. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading that book, though. Yes, um, I'm about just over a third of the way through currently, so not too much in regards to plot revelations so far, just lots of, you know, big space battle explosions. Um, Mercedes Ollerton's back in it. Makes a yeah, fucking Mercedes. change. Yeah, we knew that. I know, but it makes a change because she, considering she hasn't actually done anything for God knows how long. Um... <laughs> I will say this, the book itself is absolutely gorgeous though it is a gorgeous book yeah that book. limited edition is is pretty stunning I mean just so you can all listen to it at home there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just give it the, give it a bit of an old slap um, okay. I wish I had uh, space on shelves that I could actually afford limited editions but alas I don't I have to do everything digitally uh, apartment life. So what else have you been reading, Ram? Well, aside from that, I did manage to read um, the Angron Primark novel. And that had quite a lot of interesting revelations. And I will say it's actually my favourite one of the Primark series now. So it's a good one. Oh, wow, okay. That was um, Ian St. Martin writing it, eh? It was, yes. I have not read anything of his yet, so I'm actually looking forward to getting to getting down to grips with him as an author. Um... The funny thing is, though, most of the story doesn't actually revolve around anger. It revolves around um, one of the World Eater Centurions. But there is a lot of flashback scenes with Angron on Nuceria. Um, yeah. Like, we found out what he's like before the Butcher's Nails. And one of and he was basically a very generally empathic dude. Um, he also had the ability to psychically take the pain away from other people and take it into himself. I swear I'd heard of that before, somewhere. Not in Warhammer, but somewhere. That's uh, that, it, it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting twist on Angron as a character. That the nails, for one thing, it, it, it this this power was lost when the nails got put in, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's anything psychic. I I love it because it makes. Not that the nails necessarily needed it, but they make them even more tragic. Yep. Um, which, you know, <laughs> they're the most tragic, they're the most iconic thing about him and also his deepest tragedy. So anything that makes them even more so is a good thing in my book. We also found out what his name actually means. Um, it's actually um, Nusarian for Child of the Mountain. The makes mountain sense. that he, the mountain that he... Uh, Was found on. And murdered a whole bunch of Eldar on. They, yeah. they actually kind of retcon that slightly. That instead of him murdering a whole bunch of Eldar, he was actually being chased by them. He killed a couple by throwing rocks at them, like <laughs> using his Primark strength. He wasn't a baby at this point. It's important to stress this out, but he's like physically about the size of like an eight year old, something like that. Okay. Still a child. Yeah, still a child, but not a baby. Mm -hmm. So. Isn't it, so it wasn't just a baby murdered a whole bunch of, you know, of the Cabal's acolytes or anything like that. But, like, they ran away when the Nusarian slavers turned up. So he didn't kill them all. Hmm. I'm... Uh, the, only, the only thing is, the only slight disappointment about that is that in my head it was similar to the opening scene of um, Kung Pao Enter the Fist where Angron as a baby is, <laughs> is just rolling down the hill, crying. <laughs> and then some woman finds him and it's like, oh, a baby! And then she just throws him off the cliff on the other side and he keeps going. In my head, that's the canon. <laughs> I mean, it would have been interesting to see how they try and do that deadpan serious. 
<laughs> That's the best part. Um, we also found out who the first person to take the butcher's nails and survive was. No big surprise, it was fucking Khan. Of course not. <laughs> but we also found out was. why they don't do it on the librarians, like how they found out not to do it on the librarians, because they tried to use it on a librarian and he blew up half of a spaceship. Oh, seriously? That's fucking cool. Like, literally, he st- like they put in the butcher's nails, he started getting really angry, and then boom. Okay, hang on a sec. Just, just, so, a librarian gets butcher's nails, so a psyker gets the nails yeah. and blows up half a ship. Yeah, just from being very angry. So why, if Angron has this psychic ability, which we know he has now to be the sort of empath and pain stealer... Because... Um, his butcher's nails were derived from an STC. The ones in the Legion were basically very crude imitations, so they're not as advanced as his. Yeah, they were built on his pattern of nails, and like there were, I think the Tech Marines and the Attendant Mechanicum adepts made a whole lot of guesses about how they worked. Yeah, the only way they managed to get a working version of it was due to a compliance they were actually undertaking, where there was. Basically, a whole bunch of cyborgs who killed the world eaters by cuddling them to death. No, I'm not even joking. They literally just walked up to them and hugged them to death and crushed them under the weight of their bodies. So there was just a whole planet of Vulcans? Kind of. And and the funny thing was, um, the world eaters lost initially. They were forced to withdraw. And Angron was like, what weapons do they have? They didn't use any. What? (laughs) <laughs> you lost by people who had no weapons <laughs> I imagine he took that calm and reasonably uh, not quite though we did find out um, the World Eaters Legion literally every compliance they have they have to complete in 36 hours otherwise Angron literally kills 10% of the entire Legion and I thought Perturabo was a bit of a douche to his own Legion <laughs> For one decimation. Why are there so many decimations going around the future traitor legions? You get a decimation. You get a decimation. Everybody gets a decimation. And does Angron not like, realize that the more he does that, like let's say the world eaters loot fail, so he decimates. There's now 90% of a legion. You throw that 90% at the next invasion. There's less of them, so they're more likely to fail. So you kill another 9%. Or ten percent, which is actually nine percent, you're down to eighty one percent of your original legion. Then you go again, but you now have eighty one percent. It's just a vicious circle of mass suicide. <laughs> yep. Um and then when Angron orders, you know, for the decimation to occur, um Centurion Mago, he basically turns around and says no to Angron. Angron's like, What did you just say? No. Ha! Finally someone's got balls. Alright, I'll let you choose who dies then. No. <sighs> As an anger literally loses his mark, goes completely ape shit, and starts butchering everyone in the Hall of Triumphs, and everyone's like, oh shit! <laughs> and literally, the librarians had to go, right, we have to calm Angron down, use our, mic- use our minds to link together to make a giant gladiator out of lightning to beat the shit out of him. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Um, and then one of the younger librarians, he gets his mind gets a bit too close to Angron's, and then there's a big psychic shock wave, um, and both Angron and this young librarian are basically comatose. <laughs> and it turns out their minds are linked at this point, which is how we're getting the flashback scenes in the novel, because the librarians experience it through Angron's eyes. Oh, that's a neat little plot device. Clever. Or narrative device, I should say. Yeah, and it's... It's really a shame that, the, yeah, the the nails. Because obviously we see all this with Angron and you just, you sort of facepalm at the idiocy and the ridiculousness of Angron with the World Eaters. But then you think, imagine how useful someone who could inspire their warriors by almost healing them without healing them and having this incredible tolerance for pain and suffering that can just go and go and go. And we know Angron was an incredible leader because he inspired the Eaters of Cities to keep going and kept them going on the force of his own body, literally, because he was feeding them blood. And you just think, imagine that force in the crusade, how useful and how powerful that would have been. I'm not saying he'd have been war master or anything like that, but a pure Angron, a non-nailed Angron could have been a legend. 
among the guardsmen even, just by healing them by walking next to them. But no, he got nailed. So yeah, he quite did. interesting as well. Um, one of the first creatures with nails and encounters is a pair of ogrins with butcher's nails. Oof. Oy. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, ogrin, um Karenites, basically? Kind of, yeah. Also, we actually see um, Angron's father figure character. He has one? He has one. It's an old gladiator who basically acts as his mentor. Oh, good. I'm glad that he... Is his name a reference? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, but Spartacon. It's not It's not like Spartacus or anything like that, no. Um, but it's like the, this old gladiator who takes Angron under his wing. He's like the only gladiator that survives along with Angron. And then once Angron gets the butcher's nails, he ends up killing his father figure. Oh, uh, because... God, it's just tragedy after tragedy for that guy. Yeah. But again, as I said, I'm, 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 backstory story beats. I'm more than happy for them to just play up the tragedy, especially as like what you were saying about um, imagine what he could have been. That is always the thing with Angron and the thing that like the novels have always been playing up is just like, oh, imagine like you're frustrated at him because you knew, you know what his potential is um, and what yeah. he could have been. But for the fact that he is just fundamentally broken. Yeah. And it's interesting because obviously back in the day before the heresy novels really got him by the everything and sorted him out, Angron was probably one of the least popular Primarchs. And then Betrayer yep. happened. And everybody flipped on Angron. And I think GW has, we've got a gold character here who can show something very different. And using Lorgar is a, another way to screw him over. And it just, yeah, it's it's a really clever way of turning a character without changing anything mm-hmm. about them. I mean, it's how it worked with the um, the Lorgar novel as well. You know, showing him as a child how Corfran was such an abusive parent to him, constantly beating him and stuff like that. And you felt genuine sympathy for Lorgar. And I don't think anyone ever would have felt sympathy for Lorgar before reading that book. Well, you can, you can, it's much easier to feel genuine sympathy for Lorgar when you can, when you can feel nothing but unabashed hatred for Erebus. And Corfer, and Corferon. <laughs> and Corferon to a somewhat lesser extent. Like, the, the, I, I the, the I softening the so- than Erebus. <laughs> I, I still haven't read the Lorgar novel yet, but it's very much on the list for that particular reason. Tr- trust uh, me, the so- you, the so- you, you hate Corferon more. Trust me. <laughs> the softening of Lorgar did have to come in tandem with the, shall we say, playing up of Erebus's particular role. That that absolute... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the interestingly, despite the fact that he's had novel after novel after novel, one character who I think is still a very Marmite character is Fulgrim. Because I... Despite everything I've seen about Fulgrim, all the things he did, all the things he does, I can't like him at all. Because his turn is so pathetic and flimsy and weak. Selfish. And it, just makes you think, hmm. it was selfish. His, his, his turn was selfish. Oh, I thought you said it's like saddlefish or something. <laughs> saddlefish. <laughs> Paul Grimm's a saddlefish. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Tell anyway. you who, riding my giant seahorse. He's an Idoneth. Damn it, you beat me to the jump. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, despite the fact that he's had Fulgrim, there was Angel Exterminatus, there's been his um, Primark novel, I can't find a way to like Fulgrim. But I know some people absolutely love it. Um, the Fulgrim Palatine Phoenix novel? That one, yes. Just started it. So get me back on in a, couple have you of, in a few to weeks the, and I'll, gonna, give you, I'll give you a review. <laughs> have you gone to the scene yet with the most adorable... Bit of information ever with the studies with his tiny little plate. Uh, no, I have not. I, you haven't got to the buffet yet. Oh. No, not the buffet. It's been literally just like the start. The thing, the thing about Fulgrim is, and um, like I, I don't disagree that his turn compared to some of the reasons for the other downfalls are is a little bit weak. I think in certain, in other parts of the heresy, it's been fleshed out a little bit more, uh, like with Angel Exterminatus, for instance. Um, the only thing, the, the biggest mischaracterization about Fulgrim, and it's, it is actually for me something that the fans get wrong, um, and it plays into what, it plays into my aforementioned love for Jagatai Khan. It's that line that's oft quoted about Fulgrim 
Fulgrim and Jagatai, I think it's on Olinor, and they're talking, they're kind of having a bit of a sparring contest. Oh, with the greatest sparring. roast that ever roasted. S- sort of. Because they're having a sparring contest with words about uh, who would be the better swordsman. Fulgrim's just like, it's obviously me, and the Khan is just like, if you were ever to challenge me, you wouldn't have time enough to say those words, blah, 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 back and forth. And Fulgrim gets snippy because he's Fulgrim and says to the Khan, uh, I heard you do strange things to your ships. And the, and the Khan, without missing a beat, snaps back, I heard you do strange things to your warriors. Now, Hottest well, race since Prospero. It is a superb roast, but what everyone gets wrong about it is that he is not talking about the thing that you all think he's talking about. (laughs) He's talking about genetic modification of the Emperor's children to make them, like, all screamy, like Eidolon was before Istvan. That's what he's talking- And also saving them from the blight. Yes. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the other thing that you all think he's talking about. I just want to get that out there on air because it is one of the, it's one of the things that I see quoted so often, but also like, yeah, you're not, no, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. Anyway, that's Oculus' little rant about that over. (laughs) But I think we can all agree the best moment in any of the Primarchs novels is when Ferris Manus caught a Laz Cannon beam and crushed it. Uh, well, yes. That and eat the sand. <laughs> Sandwiches. Well, <Well-fits. laughs> fits. <laughs> or, or, let's be honest, how about that one scene where Sevatar called Aramina a patronizing Terran shithead? That was also wonderful. <laughs> Or, Raboot, Raboot, you appear to have lost your temper. I'm going to gut you. You have indeed lost your temper. <laughs> Who did you say that to? Uh, that was to that was a, an, an exchange between Gulliman and Lorgar. Yep, that sounds about right. <laughs> um... If we're talking Primarch clapbacks, uh, and again, it's a just from it's just from the Warhawk novel. Uh, Sanguinius has the most beautiful line after Jagatai talks about kind of his frustration with regards to how the Imperium has named the White Scars. Um, Sanguinius has this amazing line about where it's it's something like, "We are what they want us to be. We are as they see us." And then he he like leans in comic like leans in exaggeratedly and just says, "Between you and me, I'm not actually an angel," which is just it's so perfectly it's so perfectly Sanguinius because it's got that wonderful understanding about his role within the Imperium that I'm not sure a lot of the a lot of his brothers actually quite grasp. Jagatai did. Jagatai. Mm, Jagatai understood more about the Imperium than others did, and that's why he kind of wanted to be a little bit outside it. Yeah, because he has that quote to Horus and Olinor, it's like, that we are hunters, and that when there is nothing to hunt, what will be left for, of us? Or something of that order. Fucking Discord. <laughs> 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 oh, one thing I do want to, to... One thing I will spoil from Solar War about Abaddon... Um, they did confirm he is not a clone of Horus. That I'm glad they finally put paid to. I don't think anyone really gave it a lot that theory, that particular theory, a lot of credence. Um, at least speaking for myself. Uh, but it's something that I'm glad that we finally have a little bit of a hard no on. Yeah, because um, there's like a scene where Abaddon's reminiscing about his childhood and where he murders his biological father. It's it's important for Abaddon because it would be a remarkable cheapening of the character if he's just like he's Horus too, but better. Like it's much more compelling if he's a dude who is just keeping going, keep on going through the like because he's just too angry to give up. Local man too angry to die. Exactly. Like the Primarchs are the Primarchs are great as characters, but sometimes aren't compelling in in a way that they could be because they're literally made to be amazing. Like they're constructed to be amazing. And while you can argue that, yeah, Abaddon is still an Astartes, he's obviously got all that going for our, for him. He's still just not that different in Astartes to pretty much all other Astartes. Yeah. Yeah. 
And there are other characters like that dotted across the legions. The first captains, we don't know all of them, but the first captains are very interesting characters, pretty much across the board. You've got characters like Ahriman, Sigismund. Uh, you've got, I think, Corswain? Was he first captain? Not sure. Uh, you've got Sevatar. You've got, no. effectively, Khan. Well, at this he's point, actually. at this point, Sevatar's not really involved anymore. You know what I mean, though? <laughs> like, in the Heresy era, you look at the characters that they talk about. Like, yeah, the Primarchs are these super mega badasses, and they're all interesting characters... 99% of the time. But you then look at the people around them, the Lokans, the Abaddons, and characters like Ahriman, who go on to have long lives, and Sevatar, who doesn't. And well, we don't them... know about Sevatar yet. Okay, who has not shown up since, so I can't say he's had a I, No, I, I know. Sevatar is just a giant question mark. Um, <laughs> so I'm, is... still waiting for, I'm still waiting for them to introduce um, Joe Zahal, considering he was first captain by the time Nighthawk had died. So uh, where's the, night, the, night lords, the night lords are present on Terra during the siege, right? Mm, yes. they, they haven't been mentioned in Solar War so far. It's mm -hmm. mainly just been Sons of Horus and the Iron Warriors so far. Okay. Some of them are there, though, I believe. Um, not all of them, but hey, some of them. Let me just double check the dramatic persona. I might sell what lead are in. Let me just double check. Da, da, da. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're just not in, if they're not in Solar War. I think I'm more just... I, I can't quite remember. I was I was under the impression that right. that at least elements of all of the traitor legions oh, were yeah. present during How the siege. How did I forget forget that? Um, but yeah, um, I'm gonna have to cut that one out too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but traitor legions, we've got Sons of Horus, we've got um, Iron Warriors, Thousand Sons, and Word Bearers so far. I can't believe I, I forgot uh, Thousand Sons, considering that at the beginning there's a big conversation between Abaddon and Araman, and Abaddon's really pissed off because Araman showed up as an astral projection. <laughs> I mean, astral projection is kind of Thousand Sons' gimmick the third. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's their primary gimmick. It's been their gimmick since they've since Prospero, right? Yeah. Well, their gimmick since Prospero has been turning into dust, but you know. Oh, and... Big props to Abaddon for nearly killing Zardu Layak, because I can't stand that guy. <laughs> Why do you hate Zardu Layak? Just because I don't like Zardu Layak. <laughs> <laughs> it's, more of an like it's more of an instinctual dislike. Yes. I actually found him pretty compelling during Slaves to Darkness. Which over which overall I did like I en I enjoyed for what it set up. Um I particularly enjoyed John French's little essay on chaos at the back, but mm. Couldn't help but feel that Slaves to Darkness was a little bit like two novels worth of stuff in one to kind of just like, okay, yeah. okay, let's get through this. We need to get everything set up before the siege. I mean, in fairness, it was written, it was written before Titan Death because they didn't realize Titan Death was going to be a novel. They just made Titan Death at the last minute for Beta Garmin. That I did not know. Yeah, that, that's I'm why... In, at the start of Slaves of Darkness, like, like the War Master is injured because it wasn't from Wolf Space, because of him being on Beta Garmin. <laughs> so basically, he kind of jumped forward and you jumped back to the next novel. But, um. What was and then there was first? Yarant as well. Yes. Like, the, the, um, the, 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 one may, the one quibble that I do, I do have with how. The Horus Heresy overall was released. Is that sometimes that timeline can be very confusing? Oh God! Yeah. Like I look forward to the I look forward to the flow chart that I'm inevitably going to see once. Uh, there's probably actually one now. Now that Barry Dagger is like finally the last like there, there piece is a of flow the chart, but it's like all fifty over something the place. plus puzzle. It's it's all over the place. So I'll have to go and sort that one out and just be like just get my own head around it. Should be necessary. Thank yeah. God for the internet and flowcharts. <laughs> but like, at the end of the day, in regards to Slaves to Darkness, it's something you can point to all Fulgrim fans about that Fulgrim lost a fight to Lorgar. Yes, and then Lorgar got absolutely keel-stopped. Yes. That was, to, to the credit of Slaves to Darkness, that was a twist that I did not necessarily see coming. Like, this, basically Lorgar's coup. Um, it's perfectly in line with him as a character. It's perfectly in line with how chaos works and how it's just going to always start just eating itself. Um, but also interesting that he's just not going to be there on the, at the siege. Hmm. 
So I'm looking forward to seeing how that will play. Because he knows they'll lose. Maybe. And let's not forget, you know, uh, Fulgrim's relationship with Fat Grim. <laughs> you know, the Nakari when he d- d- was dressed up as Fat Fulgrim. That was funny. <laughs> it was a bit weird. <laughs> but everything to do with Nakari is a bit weird, so I'll let it go. Yes. Slanesh. Ash. Ding. Yes. Is it time for the questions, perchance? You might want to start getting it just considering everyone's internet's playing up. Crapping out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm good. That's not a bad idea. Right, let's dive in. Uh, okay, something a little bit abstract and far-fetched, but I want to run this past you. Uh, so this comment asks, could the Rangdan Xenocides be that the Emperor or Malkador had sort of psychic the other legions to believe that the Lost Legions were Xenos? Sort of a similar idea to the Flesh Eater Cause and their warped perception of everything. So it, it would explain why so many legions took so much damage, why it was so big, why the Imperium didn't give up. They say they admit it's a stretch, but... It's <sighs> not actually unreasonable considering the fact that in Silence of the Emperor, where there's a story set during that... Apparently, the Rangdon had technology that could disguise their ships as Imperial. That would be the only thing that, for me, would potentially give that particular theory, like, claw, the only... uh, like claws. But overall, I, I don't know. To me, it, it would be a bit of an uninteresting resolution to the question of what the Rangda are. I like the idea that the galaxy is so dangerous that even the legions could potentially be screwed up by it. And plus the idea of the um, the Rangdon supposedly being the Lost Legions, it's kind of put at odds with um, the events of um, Chamber at the end of Memory when Rogaldorn finds out that it's actually him and Gilliman's fault that the Lost Legions got erased. Or that they so, were certainly a huge part of it. Yeah, and they weren't involved in the Rangdon Xenocides, as far as I'm aware. I don't think Dor... It was, I think it was Dark found. Angels and Space Wolves and the Alpha Legion. Mainly the Dark Angels, as far as I recall. Yeah, but I think the Space Wolves and definitely the Alpha Legion showed up as well at some point. The Alpha Legion were everywhere. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing of about course. the Alpha. But like, not even not even in that meme way. Like, the Alpha Legion at that particular point, what just a, over sixty years into the Crusade, like they were they were everywhere. They, they were the sailing. They were sailing around under unimpeachable authority codes and just kind of operating as a ghost legion. I it's one of my it favorite funny. parts about their lore. I just found it funny when Lionel Johnson spoke to this Alpha Legion commander. It's like, where's your Primarch? Like, oh, our Primarch hasn't turned up yet. Well, what's your name then? Oh, I'm Alpharius. That is fascinating to me. That is just wonderful because it means that the concept of Alpharius existed within the Alpha Legion pretty much from the beginning. And that the Primarch calling himself Alpharius may have simply taken it on himself that the mantle and idea of Alpharius has been a thing that has been present within the Alpha Legion since the since the very beginning, and thus, thus like is not created by Alpharius, Alpharius himself, but Alpharius is a product of the that Legion. If that makes sense, like which means it, it, the true Alpharius is like, in fact Omegon. or the true Alpharius is all of them. Like there is a Primarch, <laughs> there is a Primarch, and there's two Primarchs within the Legion. But it actually it actually makes the I am Alpharius thing much deeper. As opposed oh, to yeah. just, as opposed to the meme it's become or the fact that like, oh, we're all impersonating our Primarch. Well, maybe they're not impersonating their Primarch. Maybe their Primarch is just using a convenient name then, that he, that is really there to represent the Legion as a whole. Yeah. And because Alpharius is, or yeah, because the Primarch backstory is so shady, we don't know really anything for sure. Like, we don't even know if Alpharius Omegon had names. Because we don't know what their story was. They could have just been sole survivors of some sort of Xenos purge or something else. We don't know. So it could be that, yeah, the Alpha Legion had created, or whatever they were going under, I think Alpha was still a code sign that they did use, that Alpharius, so that they kept their anonymity, was already the call sign of any commander they had on the field. Yep. And Alpharius Omegon just decided, hey, that's convenient. We'll just use yeah. that. I like to think the, the two Primarchs' real names were Bill and Ted. <laughs> Excellent. High five. Also, I'm I'm related news, but Bill and Ted Three has been announced, and so I'm very happy about that. I know that's so weird. I'm more but... interested than in Borderlands Three, personally. Oh, you're the only one who is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding! I'm kidding! I'm kidding. Fair. 
Okay, next question. At this point in current law revisions, is the Catan known as the Outsider still a thing, or has it been completely scrubbed from canon by now? He's still a thing, as far as I'm aware. He just hasn't done anything. No, the, the, the Outsider got a name in one of the White Dwarf articles written about the Necrons, I think around when either the 5th or 6th edition... Mephitran, wasn't it? It's, uh, Mephit, Me Mephitran's the Deceiver. Yeah, Mephitran's oh, so. the Deceiver. Yeah, Maglathroth um, is the Void Dragon. Yeah. Oh god, who is it then? Um, Satan names are Catan names are weird, <laughs> difficult to remember. Uh, yeah. it, it got it got mentioned in a fifth or sixth edition thing. So he either got sharded or he's one of the ones that's still complete and just really really far away. Necron technology could have like dunked him through space time and shoved him out. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Necron Sorry. technology could have dunked him through space time and shot him out somewhere outside the galaxy. Because um, that's was the thing about the outsider is that he was quite literally outside. Whether that means outside space time or just outside the galaxy, it's not quite clear. Mm. I'm going by like third edition lore for that particular one. The, the outsider is still lore. He's still he's still canon. Just the fact that we didn't know anything about we barely knew anything about him during third, and we certainly haven't gotten anything of an update on him since. Yeah. So that's that. <laughs> okay. Um, so if traitors steal Gene Seed, which we know they do, doesn't that mean that all new recruits into, say, traitor legions don't have the Primarch's Gene Seed? They have Loyalist blood, and most legions are probably made up of only a fraction of their original Primarch. And if so, what about World Eater Blood Angels, anyone? Oof. <laughs> um, there's a character in Lords of Silence that is a more recent recruit to the Death Guard, um, who does not... I can't remember the name of him right now, but he does not... He was an ultramarine descendant, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. Uh, that's where his gene seed came from. But he wasn't... He didn't hold to a lot of how the old Legion liked to do their... Liked to handle their stuff. He found them... I don't know. He didn't find the idea of the... I think distractions, as he saw it, appealing. Um so, like, the idea that there is internal discord within it based on... Eternal discord within the Traitor Legions based on Gene Seed. I mean, that's been a thing since Hansa has been a thing, right? He was referred to as Half-Breed yeah. all the time. And it's like in yep. Sons of the Hydra as well, in this Alpha Legion warband, there's one who's formerly, you know, who's got, like, Mentor's Gene Seed, one's got Ultramarine's Gene Seed, and one's got Night Lord's Gene Seed. Exactly. So it's, it's all over the place. <laughs> the Traitor Legions are a genetic mess. They are, um, and yeah, it's. I mean, it, I mean, it's still you know, at least with the trace legions, they kind of admit like, yeah, we're using stolen gene seed. It's not like with the imperial fists who claim to all be you know descended from Rogal Dawn, where at least twenty five percent of the chapter is not sold drinkers. That um, is an odd <laughs> thing. <laughs> I mean, remember, the imperial fists got completely wiped out during the War of the Beast. They got Too rebuilt weird. using their successors. Soul Drinkers were one of those who contributed Gene Seed. They were confirmed to not be Imperial Fist successors. Has what? that been confirmed? Oh, I thought the Soul Drinkers provenance was very much a huge question mark these days. It is, but it just... I'm pretty they sure an angel Dawn. sanguine apothecary tested Gene Seed and said, yeah, it's not descended from Dawn. Yeah, that's how I even... Was that during the Soul, Drinkers, the Soul Drinkers books? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it was in the last Yeah, one. they are old. So that's just, why, that's just why I feel that the provenance is a, their provenance is a bit of a question mark for me these days. Again, if there's nothing to contradict it, it's still canon. Exactly. True. Okay. Is the community overly obsessed with memes? Ugh. Yes, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, it's, it's the, internet, the internet runs on it. Like <laughs> Memes are the currency of the internet. And thanks um, to Article 13, they'll be illegal. <laughs> so let's not go down that particular path um, no the um, I, I, this shows up a lot on my discord server like a few people will somewhat passive aggressively react with like gag emojis whenever someone makes a TTS reference um, I think defining yourself by a dislike for memes is about as boring as defining yourself by a liking of them like, yeah, sometimes jokes can be done to death, but, you know, it's all memes, memes such as they are, are also kind of a bit of 
how communication works these days. And you can sometimes communicate fun ideas with jokes um, that you that otherwise wouldn't have the same level of impact. Plus, it's all just fun. Like, ultimately, it's just fun, which is what this hobby is kind of supposed to be, you know, fun. <laughs> I think people can lose sight of that a little bit sometimes. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Is Fabius Bile one of the few people in the known universe still practicing the actual Imperial truth? I think it's mostly more of some of the traitor legions in general, because I think while a lot of them, you know, know of the Chaos Gods and dedicate themselves to the Chaos Gods, I think some of the ones from, say, you know, the less religious legions, let's say, probably do follow some tenets of it. They just view the warp as being, you know, full of warp creatures rather than demon, actual demons, as it were. Yeah, because Bile's attitude has always been, I know what you are, Chaos Gods. You're not gods. You're just a thing. The Emperor was a deluded idiot, but on that one, he was kind of right. Probably how I remember yeah, I mean, I would I would agree in that he's certainly the most empirical out of any of the major characters that I would see so far. Um, I would think Ariman might somehow kind of fall within that category. He doesn't he doesn't worship. He's spending most of his life just outrunning Zinch and Zinch's plots. Um, but I'm but if we're that. talking if we're talking actual adherence to some sort of atheistic philosophy, Bile is probably it. Yeah. Considering he looked upon the Chaos Gods and said, yeah, you're not real. <laughs> you're malignant nightmare things. You're sentient ideas, that's all you are. We do love Bile. Yep. Are the Necrons at this point a side threat? Mm, no. No, they they like <laughs> they haven't really been center stage in terms of lore or conflicts or war zones. Expect that one to change. Um, but the dynasties are still very much a thing. They're still like rising up and cutting off whole swathes of the galaxy, and I think that is an important thing to remember. Although that being said, there has seemed to have been a little bit of a tacit, uh, shall we say, reiteration of them towards more of a faction for order, quote unquote, as much as exists it exists within the 40k universe. Um what with that whole revelation from the recent Yunari novel about how there being multiple wars in heaven, and one of those wars in heaven appears to have been Eldar and Necrons versus Chaos, which I am looking forward somehow. to finding out. Somehow, that is, it's an it's an incredibly interesting tidbit and something that I'm kind of looking forward to seeing more of explored, because that is a big shakeup. It would also kind of fundamentally turn turn around what we know about Chaos um, and how it has gone, because. Chaos wasn't really as malignant as it, as we know it now until humanity started getting going. Or, well, the Eldar, you know, did the whole Slaanesh thing. Yeah, but let's, let's not forget what the Eldar did there. Let's not forgive what the Eldari did. <laughs> Point taken. Okay. Um, if Conrad Kurz were to return, they would mentioned the Corona Nox. I don't really know how that fits into anything. The Corona Nox has a soul uh, stone that he... has uh, Conrad Kurz's soul in it. Okay, so if Conrad Kurz got a body back for his soul, would he retain remain the same in terms of personality, or would he try to, and I quote, redeem himself by helping Gilliman, seeing as how his vision still came to pass and his death changed nothing? Conrad won't... Of all of the traitor Primarchs to be redeemed, I highly doubt it would be Conrad. He's way too nihilistic for that. But at the same time, his whole idea of death is nothing compared to vindication. He's like, yeah, he doesn't need to turn back because he doesn't yeah, care. He just That's what I mean about him being a nihilist. Like, he just doesn't care about all this. Yeah. Like, nothing, nothing is worth anything. Everything's shit. So, I'm oh, sorry. Nothing is worth anything. Everything's just crap. So, why care about anything? Just, you know. Yeah, he just wanted to be yeah. right. And he was right. Ultimately. Indeed. Um, okay, I'll see if I can answer. Uh, good books to get about the Age of Sigma. Um, basically, get the rule book if you can afford it. Uh, because the rule book's got like all the faction and realm law. Good place to start. Um, then probably Soul War or Sacrosanct. I forget its name. I think it's the Soul Wars novel. That's a good one, uh, probably. 
and then just get battle terms. That's probably the best way I can say for getting into AOS. Yeah, really. I, I, I can't um, I can't speak to any of the AOS fiction because I haven't dipped my toe into that particular thing. But I will say that the AOS 2.0 rulebook, not the original one, like very much the one that came out a couple of years ago, I think at this point, is number one gorgeous, and number two absolutely packed with all the lore you will need, like the full history of the mortal realms from the Age of Legend up to Soul Wars. It's great. It really uh, is great. It was 10 months ago. 10 months? It was only that? Oh, God. Okay. It, it was last June when AOS 2 came out. Um, but yeah, there's so much in that book, um, particularly if you're wanting to sort of look at the factions that have been fleshed out. But even if you don't, you just want to look at like, how did my old fantasy army get on? Oh, here's a short couple of paragraphs for you. Uh, what about the Winds of Magic? How do they work now? Well, here's a bit about Realms. Yep. And but the timeline's not exactly thorough because, well, it's not supposed to mm-hmm. be, but you have enough to build on. And one thing I would also recommend is if you're wanting to sort of get into the setting in a gaming sense is try and get your hands on this year's set of White Dwarfs because White Dwarf January had how to build and convert and paint models from Akshi. Uh, in February, they had Gyron. In March, I think it was Shimon. Um, I think next month will probably be Shaish. So you can sort of see how the people of the realms look by and how people sort of um, races look and act from those realms. So it wouldn't be much for law, but it would be good in terms of giving you understanding of just filling in the setting, I guess. Yep, exactly. So, okay, next question. What have we got? Um, not sure now. Uh, I knew you had mentioned about that thing. Yeah, there's a question here saying, did, did the Khan get a medal for that burn on Fulgrim? But, uh, we have already covered it. <laughs> we have, and no, because it didn't mean what you thought it meant. It, it, it's still a solid burn. It's still a great burn about what the Emperor's children were doing with their genetic modifications. Just not what you think it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. If Angron were to get a new model, what weapons would he actually have, given his chain axes are gone, Gorefathers are relic that's chucked around all over the place, and Gorchar and his Khans, and his black blade was broken on Armageddon by, I think it was Hyperion, the Grey Knight of Opinus? Um, that, that came out in a way that <laughs> I'm going to let you think upon. Um, he, I would love to see oh, him oh. have just, just chains just chains like hark back to the old gladiator days just have him have nothing go but kratos like, one. yeah go just, go kind of kratos except not actually have blades just have just bladed chains like just a whole ton of chains that's my answer so scorpion uh, yes get over here or he just goes in you know has a demonic version of his first chain axe widowmaker oh there we go that's a good one which is like a massive double-handed chain axe so he Big demon version of that. Yes, please. I mean, it just turns him into a, a Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster at that well, point. Considering that Angron is just a giant bloodthirster, essentially. Touche. Touche. Speaking of which, the Bloodthirster model is now the smallest of the greater demon models. I. Yes, it is. The, 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 the Scarbrand? Is it Scarbrand? The Scarbrand yes. one is. The ones that are like jumping up into the air are still pleasingly tall. But I did see that, and that did give me a little bit of a chuckle, because it will, it also highlights the fact that like the great the uh, the the Slaneshi Greater Demon model is actually the most improved out of the lot of them. Yeah, like you take the old four Greater Demons, like the old metal ones of the blood, like the Bloodthirster of old, not the old old one that I'm assuming Gremlins was talking about earlier in the show, but the one that came before this mm-hmm. one, still looked imposing and murdery and would still kind of work on the battlefields of yep. today. The Great Unclean one, you'd probably use it as a demon prince now, but still worked. it broadly yep. worked. The Lord of Change broadly still mm-hmm. worked. It was a bit small, but it was Zinchin is allowed to be small. And then you had the Keeper of Secrets, but now they've just been given all of the power boost. Scarbrand hates being small. <laughs> Garbrand also hates being tall. <laughs> and all that. <sighs> Too easy. Yes. We might need to cut it yeah. short because my neck is getting worse and worse about a minute. <laughs> all right. Well, it, okay. Do you want to cut it at that? Or you got another question? 
I mean, I've got plenty of questions. It's just if, if we've got should we do one more internet to get through it? Uh, <laughs> just yeah, sure. Drops offline. Uh, All right, Rev. We'll do one more question so that you don't have to do that again. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, so this is about the Grey Knight. So since the Grey Knights, most likely, this is something we talked about a bit last time, didn't start out as the anti-demon space marines. We don't quite know yet, and I'm sure you'll get to it in... Uh, it was in Very Dagger, they said. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Solar uh, War will... Uh, the, so, the Siege will cover that, I have no doubt. Yeah. So since they most likely weren't designed to be anti-demon on day one, what were they for? Considering they were a legion, initially, or were meant to be. So what was the plan for them? Uh, it was actually to combat chaos. It was actually revealed in Barry Dagger's like you're yeah. you're going to Titan now. <laughs> yeah, it was very much. It was very much just like we need a force of specialist space marines to specifically combat chaos. Like chaos, chaos right. demons. Now the demons are just a, obviously just an aspect. Like this was very much a a broad mandate for them, as opposed to just kill demons. Because malevolence is revealing that there were actually a bunch of. Uh, Legion assets that were created during the heresy in order to fight demons. Yes, actually. Which I'm sure and you guys like, will talk about in a future cast once you get your hands on malevolence. It's like, right, all you yeah. knights are in, you're going to Titan, uh, not you, Garrow, you're not going, fuck off. Did they actually confirm Garrow's fate? Yeah, Gar- Garrow's still on Terra. Yeah. All the other gr- all the other knights are in, apart from Loken, uh, have gone to Titan. Uh, Garrow was told, you're not going, you're staying here. And Loken basically told Ron, told Malkador to piss off. Yeah, Loken, Loken was very so much, Loken was very much uh, in the, in the like, I am not doing this. You're not making me do this. because I'm going to kill Horus. Because as, as the character that started off this series, I have to contractually be in the final novel of it one way or another. I, I, I'm going to be uh, this series as Alanius Pius. Oh, he's gonna no. It's 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 gonna end with the like I was there the day that Horus slew the emperor. Like it has to. Like yeah. there's no and way that's it's what I'm hoping for. Um, but Garrow is currently still on Terra with the seventy. You know the Death Guard from Luna. Mm-hmm. Um, even though there's not actually seventy of them left. But seven is 70. around an important number. For grandfather. <laughs> Ironic. Quiet. But yes, the Grey Knights All were right, so, the Grey Knights were yeah. a chaos force. An anti chaos force, sorry, to begin with. Very much so. Yeah. Well if they've been let to be a full legion, then we wouldn't have needed the Inquisition. Or would we? No one expects the need for the Inquisition. <laughs> Forty-year-old jokes. <laughs> but the thing is, it's true that uh, never gets old. Nope. Okay, to save Rome's internet, I think we'll call it there. Yes. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of Adeptus Podcastus. Um, we apologise for all the internet snafus. I'm sure you uh, can fix it in post. I bloody well hope so, because I'm pretty sure there's going to um, be some instances of us talking over each other when it went silent for one of us or whatever. There's at least one case of that Entirely. Happening. That's yeah. why you copy and paste dead noise. Wonderful. So, uh, thank you very much to Oculus Imperia for joining us this episode. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a delight as always. Indeed. So, until next time, this has been Remnace from 40k Theories. This has been Tactica Imperialis. And we'll see you all again next time. Bye-bye.